Healthcare is too expensive. Employers are offsetting costs onto their employees. Who will make health benefits affordable for hardworking Americans and their families? You will. This is the Empowering Plans Podcast, a show dedicated to helping you once again emphasize the benefit in Benefit Plan. Now prepare to learn, plan, save, and protect with the FIA Group. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Empowering Plans Podcast. Today, you've got me, Brady Pizarro, and Andrew Silverio, two of our best consulting attorneys. Right, Andrew? Two of our very best. Absolutely. Well, one of the best topics we have to discuss for you today is something that's kind of new. It's a larger trend we've been following for a while, and we want to take a little bit of a deep dive into a particular case that we think really shows what's going on here, and that is new TPA liabilities. These are cases in which TPAs are being found liable sometimes for actions that they didn't even necessarily take of their own volition, right? With things related to mental health parity, or in this case, gender affirming care. We've even seen this come up in the context of abortion, right? Where all these states are passing laws that are outlawing access or there's ongoing litigation about access to the abortion pill. And what do TPAs face in terms of liability if they are facilitating access to these kinds of procedures and drugs? And With respect to gender affirming care, there's really a lot going on in this area that TPAs need to be aware of and really concerned about. And so today I thought we'd go over one of the more recent cases that just came out from the Western District of Washington, because it's a case in which Blue Cross Blue Shield, serving as an ASO claims administrator, was actually found liable and will likely have to pay benefits related to gender affirming care. And they're not the plan sponsor in this case. But before we dive into this particular case, I think it's worth just backing up for a second here and going over Section 1557, because that is at the heart of this case. And so much has gone on. It's very confusing. I'll try my best to sort of unpack it without wasting all of our time doing so. But remember that Section 1557 is part of the ACA. It is the statutory text which prohibits any health program or activity, any part of which receives federal funding from discriminating against any individual on the basis of sex. And so that is in the actual ACA. Now, years later, after the ACA was passed in 2016, HHS under President Obama passed, issued a rule, right, where they expanded upon Section 1557, and they defined on the basis of sex broadly, and they included transgender individuals under that definition. Since then, a court injunction has halted enforcement of that Obama-era rule. So that rule was sort of placed on ice. Then. In 2020, the Trump administration came to power and issued their own rule, rescinding major parts of a 2016 rule, including the broad definition of on the basis of sex. So that action itself was also challenged in court. And there's another injunction preventing the rollback there. Finally, in 2021, a couple of years ago, the Biden administration issued a notice, not necessarily a rule, but just a notice that it would interpret Section 1557 to include on the basis of gender identity. So going back to that broad definition of on the basis of sex, and in doing so, they did not cite the Obama era rule, which remember was barred from being enforced, but they cited the Supreme Court case called Bostock or Bostock, which was a case of the Supreme Court about employment law. So the takeaway is that the safest course of action that we recommend and most legal experts recommend is that for purposes of section 1557, you define on the basis of sex broadly to include transgender individuals. That is the ultimate conclusion so far in this back and forth regulatory mess about what's going on. And so that's been our recommendation. With that in mind, you have this case which came up involving a transgender male, meaning this person was assigned female at birth and now identifies as male and at the time was age 17 and a dependent through his mother on a self-funded health plan. And the employer in this case was Catholic Health Initiative, so obviously a religious employer. So there's a, the basic set of facts there. They had an ASO arrangement with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Illinois serving as the claims administrator. And this individual, he sought coverage for hormone therapy. Initially, Blue Cross approved it and then later informed him that this was a mistake and that further claims would be denied related to this kind of procedure and this kind of treatment because of the plan language, which Andrew will talk about in a second. In 2019, He sought additional hormone therapy and chest reconstruction surgery. Now, those are more expensive claims, you might imagine. We're talking over $10,000. And in line with Blue Cross, with what they had said, 
they denied those claims. And so this case came about as part of a larger class action against Blue Cross, who, as we know, is a claims administrator for many, many self-funded plans. But Andrew, I want to turn to you at this point and talk about sort of what the plan language said in this case, because you can see why it became the basis for this lawsuit. Right. Yeah. So the exclusion here is really quite broad. It applies to treatment, drugs, therapy, counseling services, and supplies for or leading to gender reassignment surgery. It's basically going to encompass any gender affirming treatment that relates to, leads up to, you know, comes after uh, some sort of reassignment surgery. So in this case, we had treatment fitting into most of those categories. Like Brady mentioned, we had hormone therapy which was part of that first bundle of claims that ended up being paid seemingly because of the initial approval and then subsequent reversal. Can only presume that Blue Cross took sort of a mea culpa, we got this one wrong up front, but we're going to deny claims moving forward type of concession. But then we later had surgical claims, additional hormone therapy, and the case indicates that the plaintiff does suffer from gender dysphoria. I don't think it specifically mentioned mental health treatment as well, but it would make sense for that to be part of the course of treatment. And that is drawn into the exclusion here in question. So it's a broad sweeping exclusion to essentially any claims relating to gender dysphoria or any sort of gender affirming care. So the theory brought forth for recovery here against Blue Cross Blue Shield of Illinois was uh, section 1557 under the ACA that this exclusion discriminates against transgender individuals or really, you know, any planned participant seeking to get this care, which would necessarily only ever be transgendered individuals, with which the court sort of got into on the basis of sex. So there were a few different defenses that Blue Cross Blue Shield raised. I think Brady wanted to jump into those. Yeah, I mean, they're ones that you might expect if you're listening to the fact pattern. Your person might be thinking, well, why is it the case that Section 1557 even applies to them, right? They're not a self-funded health plan. And typically, when you think of the covered entities under this section of the ACA, you don't think of TPAs. But interestingly here, I think very, very consequently, the court found that Blue Cross does fall under the purview of Section 1557, because even though they don't receive federal funding directly in the administration of health plans, the court says that Blue Cross does receive federal financial assistance for other of its products, such as Medicare supplemental coverage, Medicaid, Medicare Advantage, and prescription drug insurance coverage. So pretty broad. They're now extending, right, expanding the scope of covered entities under Section 1557. That's a big deal because most TPAs, or certainly many TPAs, right, that otherwise would think they would not fall under the scope of Section 1557 if any part of their business, some portion of their business receives federal financial assistance, then according to this court, they would fall under the scope of Section 1557 and then have their own obligations with respect to providing coverage, or in this case, ensuring coverage is provided, because again, they're acting as claims administrator here. So that first defense, probably the most important one, I would say, raised by Blue Cross was overcome by the court, and they have expanded the scope which obviously in our industry has some pretty significant implications for TPAs who now need to be worrying about what plan language says, right? Not just thinking, well, this is the plan's problem if the plan has language which is you know, discriminatory. This could be your problem as a TPA because the court is finding a separate independent obligation for the TPA with respect to Section 1557. A few other things briefly that they said they raise as defenses, which again, on its face, Thing we think makes sense, right? They talk about how ERISA itself requires that the TPA, or in this case, the ASO, follow the express plan terms, right? As a fiduciary, right? And to the extent that Blue Cross took on some fiduciary role, they were responsible for administering the terms of the plan as they were written. But as the court notes, it's not so simple. The legal analysis here of ERISA, you'll find that it includes the obligation to comply with other federal laws. And they find in this case, Regardless of ERISA's mandate to follow the plan language you know, to the letter, the court concluded that ERISA could not be read to invalidate or impair Section 1557, nor could ERISA insulate the TPA from liability. So basically, even though the court recognizes the conflict that the TPA may be placed in, in this case, their conclusion is that the TPA should have followed the requirements of Section 1557. In fact, they say doing so is consistent with ERISA. So they get around that as well. 
one other one, and then I want your take on this, Andrew, because obviously there's implications for really all employers and TPAs who are drafting plans, is the plan design defense. So what they said here, Blue Cross is, well, we didn't draft the plan document. They offered evidence that someone else, some other consultant, drafted the plan language for them. So basically they're saying, you know, we didn't have any control over this. The plan sponsor is the one who drafted the language. And again, the court said, doesn't really matter in this case. You are in a position as TPA to administer the plan and you must do so according to the law, regardless of whether or not you, you know, drafted the plan language, doesn't actually matter. And so that's pretty noteworthy there, right? Because typically, you know, if a TPA doesn't actually draft the plan language, they may review it, but here it's much more incumbent on the TPA to know exactly what the language says because they could have their own independent obligation. Yeah, that's an important issue. And we know the plan sponsor always has, you know, the final say on what's covered under the plan, how the benefits are to be set up. But this highlights a TPA's obligation to administer benefits in a compliant way in accordance with the law, particularly federal law when it applies under ERISA. This court goes into detail outlining how ERISA is specifically drafted to give deference to other federal law, in this case, Section 1557. So yes, while a plan sponsor is the ultimate authority in determining what's covered under their plan, what the contents of the plan document are going to look like, you know, a TPA has these obligations as well. And, you know, this is a business relationship. So a TPA is perfectly justified in saying, yes, you're entitled to dictate what's covered under your plan and then what's in your plan document, but we're not going to administer non-compliant benefits. If the insistence is on this, you're going to have to find someone else to administer it. Yeah, absolutely. But the two other ones I want to cover briefly that they raised in terms of defenses, one was medical consensus. They basically argued with the cross that there's a lack of medical consensus on gender affirming care, meaning what care is needed and how it's even defined. But the court said it's not even relevant to get to that point to even to have this argument because the TPA denied coverage on the basis of the plaintiff's transgender status, not because of medical necessity. So they kind of dismissed that argument. Importantly here, the Blue Cross even conceded in the case that under their own medical guidelines, all of this care would have been considered medically necessary, (laughs) if not for the exclusion in question. So sort of a silly argument, but that, you know, they want to toss in everything they can. Sure. The same is true of this last one they argued here about the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, a recent law passed, which the which Blue Cross is arguing would insulate them from private action because they're arguing that the employer here was a religious organization, as I mentioned at the start, saying that RIFRA, as it's called by its acronym name, insulates the TPA from liability. But the court found this argument not persuasive because this federal law that was passed applies to government actions or lawsuits where the government itself is a party does not apply to a matter between private individuals, which is what this is. And so that argument cannot be used. So, I mean, I could envision a case where perhaps this employer brings a case against HHS, right, saying that your interpretation of Section 1557 based on the Bosak case is, you know, in violation of this federal law. But I'm not so sure, you know, we'll have to see how this would play out. But the Bosak case is really a strong grounding, I think, for the current administration's interpretation of Section 1557. And that's why our position is that to take the conservative approach, that you don't have these kinds of exclusions in your plan. And now, if you're a TPA, you should be extra careful to make sure that plans you're administering don't have this language. Or if they do, recognize that you can face significant liability, you know, if that's what's actually in the plan language. And so, very, very interesting case. And one last sort of twist I want to throw in as we wrap up here is, you know, one of the themes here, aside from the fact of you know, TPAs facing expanded liabilities, is just how confusing and contradictory some of the obligations TPAs have, not just with respect to ERISA. And we saw some clarification here from the court saying, look, you still got to follow existing federal law. But what about these other states that are passing laws outlawing transgender services? And we're talking about the states like Tennessee, Iowa, South Dakota, Texas, Florida, there's a ton of them. And many of these states, the statutes that they're drafting, I think one just actually passed in Utah, they're not entirely clear, sometimes by design, about who can be held liable if these procedures or treatments are actually administered. In many cases, they point to providers. In some cases, it's very broad, guardians or parents or other entities can be targeted. So could you envision a scenario, I certainly could, where a plan or TPA could be faced with a discrimination lawsuit under Section 1557 or perhaps there's some kind of violation of a state law for paying for treatment, which is now banned 
you know, for certain minors. In some cases, I think the definition of a minor was up to age 27, which is extremely strange. But in certain states, you're seeing these kinds of laws passing. So there's just so many things to juggle if you're a TPA and a health plan about what laws to follow, what should your plan language say. It's very high stakes and very high risk. And it's also evolving pretty much week to week. So that's why we want to say, you know, reach out to us with your questions on this topic, especially if you want guidance on what plan language should say, what are the best practices for TPAs to protect themselves or for plans, what's our best interpretation of Section 1557, what we think is going to happen in the future. Those are all reasons to reach out to us to ask for consultative guidance. And additionally, we'll be covering this in more detail in our March ICE webinar, which is for our ICE clients only. That's in a couple of weeks. And we'll go into this case and others as you talk about more new TPA liabilities that have come up this year, and we expect will only get more burdensome as we continue throughout the year. Any last thoughts, Andrew, on this? Yeah, you touched at the end there on the best way for a TPA to protect themselves. So, you know, looking forward after this case with the next question being, what are the damages actually going to be? You know, then at that point, when you get that final dollar amount, the TPA, the question of whether they can go back to the plan sponsor and hold them responsible since the order is really for dollars that should be covered under the plan. That's all going to be a matter of contract language. So we can look at administrative services agreements and appropriate indemnification provisions and that sort of thing as well. That's going to be an important downstream issue. Absolutely. Well, with all that, hopefully you took that all in. A lot of information we know, but that's why you can re-listen to these podcasts and get all the information again if you need to. But on behalf of myself, Angie Silverio and our man, Pat, the producer. We want to thank you all for tuning in to this another episode of the Powering Plans podcast, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.